Thank you so much for that, Gabe. Chris, uh, you know how complicated even I would say the most straightforward, if there is such a thing, of, of negotiations like this could go. But as Gabe just pointed out, this was very complicated every step of the way. You could see where every step of the way something could, and in a few cases did, put it off track. Is it fair to call this a feat of diplomacy? It really is. Just within the U.S. government, getting it through the bureaucracy of the U.S. government is a feat in and of itself. <laughs> so all three branches of government are involved in this. Um, all three have different, you know, equities in this. Um, some do not want it to happen or in a, a political season that's going to be incorporated into it. And then the variety of agencies underneath those branches all have a say in this. So it starts, um, you know, in a, a HRG, it's called at the National Security Council, a hostage recovery group starting to, to synchronize action. It'll go up to the deputies and to the principals. But ultimately, this is the president's decision. Uh, having Director Burns in, involved, who's a career diplomat, who's also in the intelligence community now, he's gifted at this, but also the SPIHA, the Special Presidential Envoy, Roger Carstens, um, he has been relentless in this work and incredibly effective over the last few years. Um, and he started in the Trump administration and continued over in the Biden administration. And, you know, he's a close friend and colleague and, and was a great partner when I was still in government. And he has a great track record in pulling this together. He's never home also, though. Yeah, there's so many aspects of this. One of them is Joe Biden, right? His long relationships, his long experience uh, in foreign affairs, uh, personal relationships, and that kind of um, biting comment to Donald Trump, but also backed up with the facts that we know. How many other foreign leaders, how many other foreign diplomats had to be uh, involved in this to get it done. And what this says um, about, honestly, what's been argued from the left and the right, Rick Stengel, how important those relationships can be. Absolutely. I mean, this was a three-dimensional chess game, and relationships matter, allies matter. The fact that Biden has had decades-long relationships with these countries and these leaders, with the German leader, you have to negotiate with someone who wants to do you a favor, who trusts you, that you have skin in the game, that you're, that you're going to not betray that person. Biden is that person for all these other folks. That's why allies matter. I want to talk about that word that he used, diplomacy, because it's kind of a fancy word that Americans don't necessarily understand. Nobody elects someone because of their diplomacy. But what diplomacy means is talking. Keep talking no matter what. That's what diplomats do, and that's what's so important. That's how you develop those relationships, and that's what you needed in an administration, that the previous administration wasn't having those conversations. This administration is. You know, Peter, one of the most extraordinary details that we have learned about um, and that you folks have reported as well as we have is that that hour before President Biden dropped out of the race for president, he's calling the prime minister of Slovenia, whose country was contributing two convicted Russian spies to the swap to secure the pardon needed uh, for the deal to proceed. What can you tell us about the White House, the State Department, others within the administration and how they work toward and prioritize this deal? Yeah, I mean, that's such a striking anecdote, right? Such a striking part of the story that the president of the United States is in uh, isolation in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, dealing with the biggest political crisis of his career, whether he should stay in the race or not, under pressure from fellow Democrats who think he cannot win anymore. And he's coming around to the conclusion that they're right and he has to drop out, which is a crushing blow for somebody who's been in politics for 50 years. And at the very same time, he has to be juggling this very complicated diplomacy that we're just talking about. As Rick said, it's not an easy thing, but, it's, but it is an important thing. And so there he is an hour before he drops out of the race on the phone with the Slovenian prime ministers asking the Slovenian prime minister to participate in this deal. And he hangs up the phone and within an hour or so, just a little over an hour, he says, I will no longer run for president for a second term. What an extraordinary day it is in the life of a president. And I think it talks about his own you know, the, the, the requirements of a president to juggle your own personal ambitions with the duties of the office, right? That, that your duties are not just to your own uh, career, but to the Americans that you represent and you lead as, as, as a president. And I think that uh, when the history books are written, that day will be prominently featured. 
Yeah, and I think some of what is written may be a little different than instantaneously was assumed in the moment. Eddie, uh, there's going to be a lot of joy in watching those families walk out uh, with the president of the United States and knowing all that they have been through for months and in some cases years. Uh, there will be sorrow elsewhere for those still being held. And we should note that according to one report, well, I think it's 40 Americans are still being held unlawfully in a dozen countries worldwide. But as the conversations are held across America, including on this program about the politics of this, Eddie, can you talk about how a divided country, um, and maybe also arguably hungry for some good news, can process this moment? Well, hopefully, well, first of all, Chris, you, you hit it right on the head. We could talk about the geopolitical intrigue. We could talk about what's been going on for the last two years and the last two weeks. We can, we can accent um, another example of how consequential Joe Biden's presidency has been uh, and perhaps will be over these last few months. But we cannot lose sight of the human element. And the human element is really, really powerful here. You know, you have mothers and fathers, daughters and sons, fam sisters and brothers, friends who are joyous today because they will have their family members back. They thought they could have lost them. They didn't know when they could have them. They were li living in the midst of the, of the unknown. And now because of a persistence, to echo Richard's point, not just simply talking, that preposition is so important, not just simply talking, Richard, but talking with, not necessarily talking at, talking with our allies, talking with Russia to make sure that we bring these folks home. So as we tell the story of the politics, as we tell the story of the diplomacy, let's not forget the human element, that there's some family today that are going to that are going to celebrate can you imagine the dinner table tonight as they know that their family members are coming home yeah there's going to be a long road ahead but it is extraordinary to think that uh, many emotions there have been other times when perhaps they thought their family member might come home and now it's actually happening Michael uh, let's talk about how the families have played a role in all of this you know for a long time I think a lot of hostage families in the past stayed quiet there was concern that they might say something that could jeopardize the possibility of a deal that that might raise questions with the other country that was involved in some kind of negotiations uh, but in the case of Brittany Griner in 2022 certainly in Evan and Paul's case their families their friends have been out front and center trying to keep their plight trying to keep their unlawful imprisonment front and center. So while these swaps obviously are ultimately resolved at the highest level, Vladimir Putin, Joe Biden, what role do families play in all this, Michael? Yeah, absolutely, Chris. This is one of the interesting uh, dynamics of these hostage swaps that seem to be becoming increasingly common. Um, is that the families are now these active participants. You, you know, you almost get to know them as characters in the media if you're following these cases. Um, and, you know, I was struck in a statement released today by the Whelan family. Uh, there was a paragraph that said that they were initially, and I know this has been true in other cases with other families, they were initially advised to stay quiet. Let's keep this quiet, keep the temperature low, because more attention... Families are often told in the beginning, more attention will only essentially raise the asking price for your loved one. The more uh, this person is seen as somebody that uh, there's a lot of political pressure for the U.S. to return, the more Russia or Iran or whatever country is holding them is going to ask in return, and that's going to make it more difficult. But what we've seen over and over, and what the Whelan family said in their statement was, they came to believe that media attention was actually incredibly useful to them and that press attention kept the U.S. government focused on the case um, and, you know, kept it from uh, fading away.